Hello, everybody. My name is Tomasz Barnasz, and I'm co-founder and CEO of Overhead 4D. I will talk today about uh, turning the real worlds into digital assets. So the general topic or the um, uh, schedule or agenda we will go through is that on the beginning, I will tell you a little bit about photogrammetry, how it's made, what are the important points, and uh, then we will see some uh, use cases and uh, some applications and projects. So first of all, um, generally for our project or for the best workflow, uh, we use photogrammetry and laser scanning for the combination. But to make a great project and great result, you still need to go through all of the optimizations and many other steps to, to get a nice result. First of all, I will show you just a short video uh, from a workflow pipeline. Looks like we don't have sound, but uh, and, and the results. So you will see what we will talk about, and then I will take the word again and, and speak about the first steps of photogrammetry. So how all of this starts? It starts with the gear. It starts with having the right equipment. Uh, so you need drones, cameras, laser scanners. All depends on uh, what you want to achieve. Of course, nowadays, uh, the photogrammetry got spread quite a lot. And you can also work with your mobile phone. But that's more the hobby solution. But if you want to achieve a good result, you need also like color checkers, GNSS stations, uh, and so on. So there are a few rules which uh, make your result successful, or maybe how you can start um, to ensure that uh, you will work well. And that's these four points, shutter speed, ISO, aperture, and also the quality of the images you are shooting. These numbers which are written there are not uh, like defined that you have to use them. It's just a guideline to see uh, how your images could be well prepared for further optimization. When we speak about the raw images, I specifically choose this like, kind of very bad image where you can see overexposed area, black areas, and what happens. So if you shoot or capture the uh, images in JPEG and you are trying in pre-process to optimize the image to save uh, the mistakes you have made on site, you can see on the top from the JPEG, you actually just extract the, the darkness or the gray color. So you are not extracting the information which you could have. If you are using raw, even though images may be five times bigger than the JPEG and people are scared of uh, collecting huge amount of data, you can still save a lot of information and it's really, it's worth it. Um, the same with color correction. So there are many uh, like 
various situations. If you are outside, the sunshine, then darkness and everything, and, and you need to balance these pictures and therefore you need a raw image. There are also like golden rules of photogrammetry. There are these two numbers actually. So 80% of the overlap, that's kind of an optimal. Of course, you can have less, you can have more. And 30 degrees of the angle of the camera. What that means, like if you're capturing an image and you are going to shoot another picture and you rotate the camera too much, uh, it can lead to misalignment. Um, how does it look actually? You can see on these uh, two examples uh, what means a good overlap. So we say normally that the best is if you can see three times the same uh, part of the uh, image. Uh, you can see also on the bottom three images that it looks actually good, but if you focus a little bit more and you see the uh, window on that uh, church, you can see that even though the overlap looks good, you can see the window just two times. And those are the things which you always have to uh, take care about when you are on site. And the angle, it's also, it sounds super simple, like everybody who's going to do photogrammetry knows about these rules, but many times you forget it on site. And then you are just moving or doing something faster and then you forget about this, this angle. For example, this, exa uh, this, this picture, you can see it pretty well. If you are capturing by the drone and then from the ground actually, so the drone imagery goes down uh, and the ground images are going upwards and the angle you will have there, it's over 100 degrees, so it's almost impossible to align. Of course, you can align it with control points, but uh, you will need a lot of time to place them, and uh, yeah, that takes your time. Capturing the objects, the same example, yeah? The angle, so you have to take care about the angle. Uh, yeah, so seeing various uh, areas, so we can capture the area, like landscapes, we can capture the buildings and we can capture some objects. So if we have landscapes, many times uh, you need to deal with the uh, long times of flying, so you need some kind of structure, but you also have to take care about uh, like overlap and not just flying in one area. Because if it's a flat ground and you're capturing everything just in one line or in one grid, it has a tendency to bend the terrain. So you have to bring there some orbital flights find your focus and uh, also like choose the areas which are the most important for you and the rest you can capture a little bit less. Uh, going to the buildings, um, there are various ways how you can capture it. So actually what I'm showing here, it's not the way how you have to do it or how it's correct because the best way to capture something is always to maintain the same distance from the uh, camera to the object. Here you can see different uh, distances. Why it's so? It's just showing like if you want to capture something with less resolution, you can fly these big grids which are uh, up there with the red and orange, and then you have these green and blue lines uh, with the big orbital flights around the building. That can, uh, by this you can achieve your quality if that's what, what you need. And this is also easy to um, align then because you have very good overlap. Once you are going very close and you are capturing facades, you have to take care that um, you maintain even higher overlap to be able to align it. But by using this kind of work close, you can also, for example, in reality capture, use uh, uh, like uh, workflow where you just uh, use all the images for the alignment. And then if you're going for meshing and texturing, you can pick just the closest images. And, and so like with this far away flights, you can ensure your good alignment. And with the cl close up images, you are getting actually the high resolution of the textures and the mesh. Uh, the easiest way how to um, explain it and show it is on the object, because if you should maintain the same distance from every image to the object, the easiest way is to have like a small object and then you can take care about uh, good distance. Outside, it's more complex. And outside, we speak more about this case where you uh, like capture two levels, as I mentioned very close level and very far level. And then you combine it for meshing. I will not go too deep into that because it can get very long then. Uh, but uh, next step, what you can add to your scanning or to your um, like gathering data is laser scanning. And uh, this is also kind of, uh, in some way, a photogrammetry because every scan is collecting the images and when you bring it to reality capture, you are actually not using the point clouds to align, you are using the images to align. So you also have to take care about it that you don't have only one position of the scanner, 
because then you can't really align it with the images. So you need multiple scanners, and as well with the images, what I mentioned, with the overlap and angles, this is as well um, applicable for the uh, laser scans where you have to have the good overlap with the images. In that moment, you can combine the uh, both technologies and you can achieve best result. Why would you use the laser scanner or what does the laser scanner actually with your models? This is one example where you can see the model for pure photogrammetry. If you look at the structure of the wall and if you look at the geometry, it looks good, but the structure is a little bit noisy. Once we bring a laser scanner, it actually smooths out, or it doesn't smooth out, but it doesn't capture the noise from the images. So once more, like, just the, the exchange. So therefore, it's important, like, if you have some geometries, if you have some buildings, modern buildings, for example, with white walls, that's all very complicated to capture by photogrammetry, and therefore you need to go with, uh, with, the, with the laser. And um, as well, like, here, you have various workflows in reality capture where you can switch off the uh, images for meshing, and you are meshing only from laser, and then you bring the images just for texturing. So this ensure like very, the best quality. Uh, and coming to the showcases and to results and projects, I will start with the section of cultural heritage. So uh, cultural heritage and like old objects are very good objects to capture and to do photogrammetry because they don't have uh, glossy surfaces, they don't, they don't have uh, a lot of glass, white walls and everything. So you have a lot of features to capture. And in that case, like if you're flying around, scanning, uh, you can gain very good structures. For example, here you can see a use case where we have captured interior and exterior. So this is another example where you have to work carefully to bring these two things together. Uh, the best way is if you have at least two or three entrances to the building, because then you can ensure that the interior is not bending or intersecting in the wrong way. Uh, on the left, left corner, you can see a like, nice detailed structure. Uh, in total, for this project, were used around 10,000 images and maybe 50 laser scanners to ensure like, uh, nice quality. And here you can see the result. So photorealistic textures, interior, exterior, you can use the uh, section through the object. Uh, it can be used for various cases. Um, and this is the one part. So this is uh, the part where you actually capture the existing uh, thing. So you capture something what is there, and you can use it only like it is. But in most cases, we try to bring something uh, more. So we, we do a lot of reconstruction. We collaborate with historians. And we then reconstruct the buildings also to another look. So we use photogrammetry as a base. And therefore, like, it's great also to know that it's not all just to capture and keep it like it is. But you can go further and you can actually develop something what you can't see in reality. Uh, that you will see now in this example. So again, gathering the data with the drones, with the lasers, uh, all depending on the uh, detail you need. And here this uh, picture is showing ex exactly what I mentioned. So on the left side, you have the uh, photogrammetry aligned in reality capture with a spare point cloud. So you see the points, how it's registered. The middle part is uh, mesh uh, visualized from the 3D scan. And the right part there we will get now in the next slides, it's about uh, reconstructing that kind of castle to the look from 17th century. So all of that starts again like with capturing for that case it was around six or seven thousand images of the exterior and uh, interior and exterior of the uh, castle. And uh, then as I mentioned, uh, what is the different he difference here between like gaming or games and uh, this kind of projects is that uh, we are mainly creating uh, something what comes from real research. So it's not a fiction, it's mainly like work on some kind of underlays on technical constructions. So here you can see some sketches which are helping to uh, develop the past look of uh, the castle which was captured in photogra by photogrammetry. And you can see here this nice overlay with the actually past look and the current stage. Uh, yeah, step by step, it's getting then also the materials which needs to be produced, trying to uh, represent the materials and look from the past so the walls can't stay really flat and you're trying to achieve the, uh, like this old, old feeling there. Uh, having this is like 
very nice. You get uh, visualization or animation, and people are, are are used to like getting some kind of images. But uh, when we then speak about um, Unreal Engine, uh, you can get much more. So the visualization is just one part of it, but you can get a lot of other applications as uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, touch applications. And here you can, for example, see that uh, this castle was made for augmented reality, where you can come to the real like, ruin of the castle. You can take your phone, you can, you can view it, and you mix the reality. So you see actually something what was done in the past. Uh, this is also a nice thing that it's visual, but it also brings, again, young people to um, culture. So uh, the problem nowadays is that young, young people, the young generation doesn't really like to go to museums and to the castles, and everybody wants to play with the phones and, and capture something, make selfies. And like this, you can give them a tool that they can play and learn. So this is really like, helpful. Here you can see another use case uh, where it's like a touch application, which is helping guides to uh, give the information to people. And uh, another part is like visualization. What I mentioned that it's not the only way how you can uh, like finish your project. And here, uh, like showing this ant was just an idea to uh, give you a feeling about the detail which can be achieved. So that all what is uh, there now, it's from photogrammetry, it's existing. And this part was actually reconstructed to the, together with historicians. Uh, the way how it's cracking and how it's falling was not about like making super realistic crack. The, the idea or the, the target was to make uh, the destruction in the way how it was supposed to be in the past, that all the ruins are actually on the position which are found now. So it's kind of, construction of that and you can see this combination of a huge land huge area and uh, very nice details so the area around castle was captured and it was combined with the uh, uh, map map data which are available so we extended the area like as you can see it was just yeah, yeah all the tests and trying the, uh, to process all of these and then simulating the lighting situations Having those data, um, all what I showed now was visual or application visualization. But uh, once you gather the data and they are accurate, you can use them also for the technical underlays. So here in this case, also from all of these like nice visual things were extracted also these data, which are used for um, architects for a construction of the walls in the castles or can be in any uh, other field. But here you can see that you are combining something what people know as a gaming industry or like very visual, but uh, you, you may not forget that uh, if you do it like with the GPS or with GNSS station that you really georeference that, you are getting very accurate data, much better than if you are measuring that on site in real. Uh, like as well getting extracting the orthophoto maps inside where you can measure so there's there's like uh, pictures which are without perspective and you can always use them for measuring and uh, coming from these big uh, areas or like castles uh, to the small parts small objects uh, I'm showing because having a nice scene or nice application it's not just about having like one huge scenery you have to always think that if you are making an interaction and giving people a tool to walk wherever they want, they also need something more detailed, something where they can touch and play with. And here you can see objects like the smallest one on the left side is uh, like two centimeters uh, small and still use the same technology, the technology of photogrammetry, like capturing really nice details. Um, yeah, this is also a key uh, where you can see normal maps extracted also from photogrammetry. So uh, looking at the workflow of the objects, as I mentioned, like the best is to uh, maintain the uh, same distance all over. 
So for the objects, many times uh, we are using or, or there are used uh, the turntables, which are helping you to rotate the objects uh, correctly and don't move too far from them. So you can also see it here on the, uh, in the corner, how accurate then the circles are made and how easy it's then reconstruct the objects because you can uh, really measure how many degrees you are doing the rotation. So this is very helpful. And uh, there you can see also the structure of the textile. So we speak here about like below millimeter accuracy. Yeah. And uh, like, as I said, like together in combination with the whole scenery and the small objects, you are, you are able to create a nice application, which can be for VR, AR, or any other apps. So um, coming more now from this cultural heritage side um, to the area of uh, producing some applications, so not games, but interactive applications. Uh, I will show you now some results and also some uh, various scenarios. So we will go to cave scanning, underwater scanning, mountains, and very complex areas. So here one video from a cave. Uh, as I mentioned on the beginning, like the key to success with every project is to do uh, good planning and to uh, like capture the data correctly. So you have to know where you go, what you are planning to do, and uh, you have to adjust the workflow according to that. For example, here we had to go with uh, uh, huge batteries uh, to have the lighting inside because like there is no electricity. And uh, if you are combining laser scans and photogrammetry, you need to uh, light up very nice the scene uh, over entire pro uh, process. So you can see like uh, we could walk in that gallery, uh, in the cave. And having this environment is again just a first step. So you have a realistic place and then you can decide if you're going to show it realistic or if you want to do anything extra. It can be just like, let's say for kids or for fun that you create some fiction or there can be a story behind, which I will explain now. So uh, having going from the underground to the mountains. Uh, these peaks are uh, above two and a half thousand uh, meters above the sea level. Uh, what is interesting here is that uh, not on every place you get a permission to fly a drone. So for example, here you have very small peak, very dangerous area, but you can't fly a drone there. So you have to have um, equipment which allow you like long poles and uh, yeah, you need a good team, which is <laughs> uh, which is willing to climb there and and risk the the moment that they uh, yeah they don't manage. But uh, we have like good guys and climbers also to uh, walk around these areas. And uh, nice on this is that um, the, the part of the project was to capture like six highest peaks uh, in Slovakia to bring them actually to uh, people which are uh, disabled for walking or they, they uh, don't have a condition to uh, climb so high. And you can uh, bring them through VR uh, the possibility to walk on the peak and see the view around. But as I said, like showing just the reality is one thing, but you can also create a story behind. And uh, here we found like some books about the legends, about the mountains that like thousands of years ago, they were found some uh, shipwrecks. And that means that long uh, time back, there might be like a water level above this peak. It's a legend. It might not be true, maybe, but uh, uh, we brought it like this, that you have a guide, which is a whale, and it's giving you this hint that, okay, that there might be something. And this whale takes you then to the, another peak, where is another story, again, based on the legends. So photogrammetry doesn't give you just the, uh, like realistic thing to use just one-to-one, -one, but you can also adjust it and play with it. Speaking about underwater life, this technology works also underwater. Uh, this project we have done with uh, professional divers, which are uh, focused on underwater photogrammetry actually, because the wreck is 72 meters below the sea level. And uh, actually they have captured this wreck uh, back in 2000. So they didn't have any ROVs, which they have now, and they are pretty fast with that. So in that time, they, they needed, I think, around 10 years just to capture around 20,000 images because it was super deep and uh, you can spend maybe five to 10 minutes a day to capture. So it took them very long time to, to collect all the data. 
And based on this, we could reconstruct it in the form and in the way how it is uh, actually down there. And also, thanks to the footage from them, we could also uh, make the atmosphere and lighting. Everything is set to the uh, like real feeling. And like this, they have it in the museum and they can show it to people uh, how it's down there. And that was again just the first step because just showing that what exists is easy. But uh, another research came when we worked with a historian from Sweden, which sketched how the look, how, how the ship could look like in the, in the 16th century. And we used this model as kind of a puzzle. So we start to cut through and start to model and bring back uh, everything what uh, like like a puzzle. So start to collect it. And yeah, here you can see like building up the whole entire ship and coming to the uh, final visualization of it where we really have all the details. Uh, it was like extremely long process because it's back and forth with historians to uh, check how it is because they want it to be very accurate. And, uh, and so we could build this model in that look. And once you again have it, then you can go a step further. And we simulated the last battle and the way how it was cracked. And uh, currently we are working also on the like, last step that when it explodes, that how it was possible that it fall down on the ground, how it is. So again, like this full reconstruction of the of that entire process. Yeah various scenarios, lighting, night, day. Yeah, that was about the environments and history. And uh, now we will have a few slides relating modern buildings, city, digital twin, and uh, like how, how to capture uh, this part and what is there very like dangerous and risky, what I already mentioned actually on the beginning, that we have uh, edgy architecture, not enough seams on the walls because it's, it's flat, it's, there's a lot of glass. Um, but here you can see currently this image is showing around 60,000 images, but uh, the entire scene was uh, built up uh, or we have captured around 100,000 images to scan the area long around seven kilometers. I don't know how bright it was exactly, but like pretty huge. Uh, the use case of the project was for real estate and new kind of city planning, so construction, road constructions and all of that. So you can see a fly through, uh, the white spots are the images placed from the drone. For this video we have disabled the images from the ground, so what you see is around 35,000 images uh, from the drone footage and we have still around 65,000 images on the ground together with laser scanners. see also this point cloud density which is just uh, meaning how many points are currently displayed on this stage but entire project was uh, I think around 10 billion polygons in the raw stage then everything needed to be optimized and prepared because uh, having a raw data and big data it's one thing but then you have to bring them to certain application and this was also made for real-time application uh, you can see here already some splitting of the areas. So you see these white buildings. That is just showcasing um, how we have separated the objects. So it's not just about like cutting them to random squares, but to optimize the scene in the best way is always to uh, pick your like points of focus. So we have chosen the buildings which are important. We have separated them and uh, yeah, optimize and texture then building by building. So you can see even though it's glass, all of this is uh, already 3D, even the sculpture on the left side. So it's, it's pretty detailed. Here you can see in certain areas, like the mesh is not maybe perfect, but therefore we had to go through ironing and optimization. So this was not done by like CAD softwares, it's still mesh, 
but uh, as the entire city was as I said, like around six kilometers long and everything ended up in one real-time application, uh, it needed to be optimized pretty well. So th there was a lot of work, manual work. And here you can see the final look with the new buildings which are going to be uh, reconstructed there. Yeah. Uh, this is kind of a mix because this is more like VFX than a than, uh, real like full 3D scene. It was just part of that project and uh, I like to show it because sometimes you don't have to uh, like uh, 3D scan everything. So that was like video footage and we brought the 3D tram inside. And again, like in Unreal Engine, you can combine whether it's like everything fully 3D or you combine video and 3D. So a um, lot of things possible. Uh, the last part, I got a bit faster than I was expecting. So uh, there is also, like I mentioned in the first part, that we had like large area scans of the castles and then we had some small objects and the same is for the cities. So you have a big city and then you have to also think about scanning some objects or um, it doesn't have to be a car, but it can be a bench or lamp, which are also part of that city. And here I just want to show how you can also bring alive the scanned object. So here we scan this car and you bring physics. Of course, this was not realistic how it would be, but uh, like having this car, having all the textures which, is, which are scanned and you can really make the physics there. You can let it uh, drive through the environment which you scan, which you use from the assets, whatever. So you can really display it nicely. 